Hello, this is David Hardman and in this presentation I'm going to describe the interactive activation model. And this is a model that was devised by McClelland and Rammelhart in the early 1980s in order to explain letter and word recognition and it was inspired by the work of Hubel and Wiesel from the mid-1960s uh, who discovered that there are neurons in the visual cortex which only respond to certain kinds of stimuli. So for example, some neurons only re respond if a person is presented with uh, a vertical line. Others only respond if presented with a diagonal line in a particular orientation. Others only respond if presented with a particular line orientation moving in a certain direction. So this diagram helps us to understand how the interactive activation model works and what it shows is uh, layers of units within a cognitive system and at the lowest level we have feature units, at the middle level we have letter units and at the top level we have word units. And to see how these work together, let's suppose that a person is presented with a letter P. So the letter P consists of a vertical line segment and a kind of reverse C shape. And at the feature level, we have two feature units that represent those particular line segments. And these become activated and they pass their activation on to units at the, letter, uh, at the letter level. And we can see here that the units representing L, E and P have become activated. Uh, so the vertical line feature unit activates both the L, the E and the P and indeed would activate various other letter units that are not shown here. And the feature unit representing the reverse C shape activates the P. Now what does the person recognize here? Well the person recognizes a letter P precisely because the letter unit for P becomes more highly activated than any of the other letter units. It's receiving activation from two feature units whereas the letter units for L and E are only receiving activation from one feature unit. Okay, so how about word recognition? Well, now we need to take into account positional information. So the model that's shown on the screen here is an extended version of what we, what we previously saw. And let's suppose that a person is presented with the word leap. Again, particular feature units become activated and they pass their activation on to the letter units. But now the letter units are taking into account positional information. So, for example, the letter unit for L in the first position of the word is activated, but not the units for L in other positions. We see that the letter unit for E in the second position is activated, the letter unit for A in the third position is activated, and the letter unit for P in the fourth position is activated. And these letter units pass on their activation to particular word units, some of which are shown on the screen here. And we can see that uh, the letter unit for L activates the word leap, the letter unit for E in the second position activates the words leap and deal, but not the word cape, which also has a letter E, but not in the second position. Uh, the letter unit for A in the third position activates both leap and deal, and the letter unit for P activates the word leap. And what the person recognizes here is indeed the word leap, again because the word unit for leap has a greater deal of activation than either of the other word units shown on the screen. Okay, well the interactive activation model also explains another finding in the literature. This is the word superiority effect 
which was first identified by Cattell in 1886, but was very convincingly demonstrated by Riker in 1969 and Wheeler in 1970, and it's sometimes called the Riker-Wheeler effect. The effect itself is the fact that when you show a person a letter in isolation and ask them to identify it, they are slower to respond than if you show them the letter in the context of a word. So let's see how that might actually look in an experimental situation. So a person on one particular trial might see a letter string like this, L-E-A-P, making up the word leap. And this would actually only be shown for a very brief moment of time before it's replaced by this visual mask. And then the person is asked to choose between two letters. Which of these letters did you see previously? So that's one kind of trial. In a second kind of trial, the first screen would show not a letter string, but just a letter in isolation, followed then by a visual mask, and then the choice. What did you see on the first screen? And it's here that people are slower to respond than they were on the first kind of trial. And there is a third kind of trial that we have, which is where the first screen again presents a letter string, but now it makes up a non-word. And that's followed by the visual mask and the choice. And again, people are slower to respond in this condition than if that first screen is showing a genuine word. So that is the word superiority effect. How is that explained by the interactive activation model? Well, let's consider a situation where on the first screen the person is shown a letter P and then subsequently they have to make a choice between two letters as to which they saw. Because they only saw the letter P in isolation, what becomes activated is the appropriate units at the feature level and the letter units for the letter P. However, when the person is shown the word leap on that first screen, then the word unit for leap becomes activated and it passes its activation back down to the letter unit level. So in this situation, the letter unit for P is receiving activation from two sources. It's receiving activation from a word unit and it is receiving activation from feature units. So in this situation, the letter unit for P is the most highly activated, and because of that, people are faster to respond. So this has been a demonstration then of the interactive activation model and how it explains the word superiority effect, and I will leave you with these references.